Hello everyone, it's Dylan G. Batista, State Representative over in Essex Junction, and I'm very pleased today to have a conversation lined up with my good friend Martin Lalonde, who is a State Representative from South Burlington. He is an attorney by trade, and he brings to the role a great deal of experience both as a school board member, as a community volunteer, and for the last three terms as a member of the House Judiciary Committee, which is the committee that deals with our laws, criminal justice reform, and things of that sort. So Martin, welcome. It's good to see you. It's Excellent. nice. You're surrounded by books. You're clean shaven. You've lost your COVID beard. You look great. How are you? Well, actually, no, it wasn't the COVID beard. I'm, I like to be a little bit uh, contrarian sometimes. So I shaved my beard the first week uh, that we were uh, out, out of the uh, state house while everybody else, not everybody, but many other people started growing their beards. You know, so that was the time for me to cut my beard. I'm a contrarian. <laughs> That's right. Well, you're a contrarian, and you're also, uh, judging by the bookshelves behind you, you're a reader, so that's good. We know that you're doing your research, and um, I've just come over the years to really respect your work, Martin. I mean, you are uh, an invaluable voice around criminal justice reform and uh, one of the epic presenters of bills. You've taken on some marathon bill presentations on the floor, which I'm talking uh, five, six, seven-hour debates sometimes on some of the bills you've carried for the committee. And that takes a special kind of person. So I want to get right into the substance of what you do. But first, I just want to thank you for all that because you're a great rep representative and we need people with that legal expertise in the house. Well, you're too kind. You're too kind. Well, I wouldn't say that. So let's get right into it, Martin. Um, I want to hear a bit about some of the continuum of criminal justice reform that the Judiciary Committee has worked on in recent years. Uh, I first started uh, as a staffer in the house uh, during uh, several bienniums ago now. And I remember you and others working then uh, on reforms to try to make our justice system more fair, equitable. I know you've worked on things like bail reform. Uh, you've worked on gun violence prevention. So can you tell us about some of the reforms you've worked on and what that continuum looks like and where we're headed here in this state of Vermont? So the issues or goals that we have, kind of overarching goals for what we're trying to do, is first of all, as I said, ensuring public safety. Uh, second is reducing the consequences of the interactions that individuals have with the criminal justice system. Uh, and finally, there's addressing the inequities and biases that we have in the criminal justice system. So we've done a number of initiatives, a number of uh, bills uh, that address those issues, and I'll go over some of those. Uh, first of all, decriminalizing certain behavior. And I think there's a lot more that can be done on that. Uh, it has been one thing we've done. And, uh, and that's specifically with respect to possession of marijuana up to one ounce, that that is no longer a criminal offense. Um, in my view, there's a lot more that should be done, particularly in the areas of, of, of drug possession. Uh, and, and I have pushed for a bill uh, that decriminalize small amounts of uh, buprenorphine. But I think probably the next step in that direction is to defelonize, make it less of a, a consequence if somebody is caught with a, an illegal substance, make it a misdemeanor perhaps, that's something that's doable. But decriminalizing, making fewer things uh, as avenues into the criminal justice system. Uh, second is to reduce uh, the incarceration rate while also making sure we're not putting public safety at risk. So uh, the bottom line is when we put individuals in prison, there's all sorts of bad things that happen. Yes, I understand that we may want and have to put certain in individuals into prison, particularly if they present a public safety uh, problem. But uh, if somebody is detained even you know, without bail, uh, they can lose their job, they can lose their housing, there could be all sorts of consequences there. If they are incarcerated in prison, uh, particularly if it's, uh, if it's a nonviolent offense, uh, they may just become better criminals. I mean, it, it's, it, the recidivism rate for individuals who actually go into prison is higher than those who are diverted from the prison system, even if, when they get into the criminal justice system. So, so we've done bail reform. We've tried to reduce the number of individuals who might be held pending trial based on the fact that they're unable to pay. So there's bail reform. The other uh, uh, to reduce incarceration is really emphasizing diversion. 
So if somebody comes into the criminal justice system, um, if there's, if there's a, just a misdemeanor, uh, they really shouldn't end up in prison. That we should send them to restorative justice. Uh, if there's an underlying addiction problem, send them to treatment, uh, but not put them in prison where there's going to be you know, worse consequences. Uh, and finally, for the concept of dealing with reducing incarceration, and there's probably more, I'm probably forgetting some, is sentencing reform. That, that this is in fact something I've been working on, I think probably five of the past years, uh, to really completely look at all of our sentences for the crimes, uh, have a, a, a more rational uh, criminal code than what we have now. We have about 900 different crimes and some of the same behavior can lead to very different uh, uh, penalties. Uh, but we're also trying to narrow uh, the scope or, or reduce really the maximum sentences on a lot of these crimes. Putting individuals in jail for a long time, just, it just is gonna cost the state a lot of money without having real good results. Now, I could keep on going, but I'm just, it's like I'm monologuing here. If you have <laughs> questions about those, I do wanna talk about a couple other you know, overall initiatives like reducing collateral consequences, rehabilitation, yeah. increasing transparency, but. Yeah, well, Martin, I, I think we should talk about that because it is so important, but I do want to just highlight something you said is that we have essentially created a situation where it might be access to housing or losing some of the fundamental needs you have, where we've created a situation where we've, in some manners, uh, criminalized poverty. And in doing that, you create a revolving door in and out of the correction system um, and providing people a way out of that uh, to ensure that they have a livelihood, a life that's decent, uh, housing options, uh, other things to ensure basic needs are met is so important. And I just don't personally feel that a system that criminalizes poverty is one that we should be celebrating. It's one to be reformed. And I know that's a lot of the work that you've done uh, has been in those areas. So I'll turn it back over to you here, but right. certainly we agree on that. And so many of these things are about giving folks another chance, a second chance and an opportunity. Um, and hopefully in the first place, to your initial point, you know, we're not successful if people are entering the criminal justice system or right. successful if they are not there. And so making sure that the laws that are on the books serve that purpose is very important. Right, absolutely, absolutely. And so, so we are trying to help with the collateral consequences of being incarcerated. If, if, if we have individuals who are coming into the system because of any number of reason, uh, we don't want that to ruin the rest of their life. There, there's a sentence and that should be the end of it. But criminal records definitely uh, cause lots of uh, problems for individuals as far as trying to get housing, uh, trying to get jobs, et cetera. So we've done a lot with respect to expunging, uh, uh, being able to allow individuals who have a misdemeanor or certain nonviolent felonies can get their criminal record expunged, in other words, erased, so that they can, on a job interview, uh, they're in fact allowed to say, I don't have a criminal record, uh, and, and that can be of assistance. So that's been a big effort uh, in expanding that. So the other thing, you know, there, there is, uh, once individuals get into prison, uh, what do we do to, to make sure that uh, we have the best outcome when most of them are gonna get out of prison? Uh, that's mostly a different committee, uh, though it's certainly something I followed with uh, uh, Justice Reinvestment uh, is this initiative where we're really looking at different ways that individuals cycle in and out of our prison system uh, to try to reduce that revolving door. Uh, housing is a component of it. Uh, making sure that there, there's proper uh, oversight or, or surveillance of, of individuals who are on probation or on parole or et cetera. Um, so that's, that's another aspect, but also trying to have more substance abuse uh, treatment within prisons to ensure that individuals' underlying problems can be addressed. And then finally, you know, as far as the big issues, and I'm sure there's lots more that we're doing, but uh, is, is transparency. And, and, and transparency is really one of the ways that we're trying to get at the issue of biases uh, and, and inequities. You know, we don't have sufficient information statewide to really understand where the biggest problems are. I mean, yes, there's biased policing. We understand that. We have seen data on that. But what happens when it gets to the state's attorney's level? 
uh, what happens as far as plea deals? Is there some sort of inequity that's going on there? Uh, the sentences that are meted out, all those kind of things. And, and part of the justice reinvestment is, uh, is a group that will really dig into what data we have, how best to obtain that data from state's attorneys and courts, and what it tells us. And, and I'm, that's probably the part I'm most excited about from, from this bill that we have passed both, both houses. And I don't know that the governor signed it yet, but uh, I don't see any reason why he would, would not, so. Yeah, well, and Martin, it's such a key piece because um, the failures of government oftentimes are because we're responding to political wins without good information or data uh, to really pull into the process and ensure that we have what we need to say, this is substantiated. And I know it's a frustrating process, but here, the fact that we haven't been collecting data adequately um, or haven't established initiatives where it is now more mandatory, and, and I know we're moving in that direction, um, it, it makes reform challenging. And so as we approach reforming our criminal justice system, but also law enforcement, those data collection efforts, and I want to get to them here in a moment, are going to be critical. So I'm glad that you highlighted that, the justice reinvestment work, uh, and some of the ways that we've tried to give uh, opportunities and second chances to those exiting incarceration to ensure that recidivism is not a sentence. And again, anything we can do uh, to ensure that we're not criminalizing poverty, uh, to me, is sort of near and dear as I think about my approach, which is really around second chances and ensuring folks have opportunities. So you just laid out a really good summary of some of the work of the committee. And I want to jump to S-219, the bill uh, that is a package of reforms to hold law enforcement accountable. And this uh, came up at the end of session here after working through a number of things. But tell us about S-219 a little bit and some of the steps that we're taking to ensure our justice system is fair, uh, impartial, and treats everyone equally. Sure. So S-219 is, is one of three bills that are kicking around uh, related to policing the police, I would, I guess that is what, how I refer to it. Uh, looking at use of force and, and uh, biases, et cetera. So S-219 uh, passed the Senate and passed the House. The other two bills, which I'll mention in a minute, uh, are, are over with the House right now. I think both of them are in government operations, um, but I, you know, I'm quite familiar with those bills as well. Uh, so S-219 did a number of things. It, it uh, expanded the data that's being collected roadside stop uh, that any use of force uh, that occurs on a roadside stop now has to be uh, reported. Uh, it provides incentives to ensure that all the law enforcement agencies throughout the state are reporting uh, that data because there's been some inconsistency in compliance with that. Uh, and it also uh, deals with uh, chokeholds. It's not, it, it, we're calling it prohibited restraints, but essentially it, uh, chokeholds that in a couple different manners. Um, for, for, but first of all, you know, the, uh, our law enforcement doesn't do training for chokeholds. They're essentially banned already within law enforcement. Uh, so it's a little bit different than perhaps some other states where chokeholds are something that are, uh, you know, that, that's permitted as a restraint. It, it's not something that we train. It's not something that is, is permitted. But, you know, to, uh, add a little bit to that, you know, uh, there's the Vermont uh, Criminal Justice Training Council, or I think that's what, or is it Vermont? I may have that wrong. The council, we'll call it. Uh, they, they oversee training uh, uh, and oversee uh, the impartial uh, policing uh, uh, policy, and they also oversee certification of law enforcement officers. And there's a number of different kinds of misconduct that can lead to certain sanctions, including up to uh, uh, decertifying somebody uh, from being able to be a law enforcement officer. And we have now uh, added uh, prohibited restraints as one of those, uh, one of the misconducts that can lead uh, to sanctions from the council. Uh, also, very importantly, a failure to intervene. If a law enforcement officer sees an other officer using a prohibited restraint or excessive force, uh, if they do not intervene and report that, uh, they could be subject to sanctions. Um, and also, two other things that the bill does uh, is it does create a crime of using a prohibited restraint. 
uh, with a up to 20 year uh, maximum sentence. Uh, and it finally requires our state law enforcement, uh, all the officers to have body cameras. Uh, so that those are the things that that covers. But critically, uh, it's just, it's really one step. You know, it's one step that we have, and there's a lot that needs to be done. And the other really overarching thing that we really looked at in the last couple of weeks was we tried to hear from a lot of different stakeholders, uh, from people representing the communities that are most impacted by uh, interactions with law enforcement. And, and we got a pretty consistent message that we needed to get this right, not rush it, you know, sl slow down and make sure that we're hearing from all those individuals uh, so that we get it right. And so we didn't try to rush the other two bills that I, I mentioned, one's S-119 and the other is S-124. Uh, those bills needed more time and more testimony. One of them, S-119 is uh, uh, use of lethal force policy. And, and that, that definitely needs to get some more input and it needs a little bit more time. Well, Martin, uh, I, I wanna point out that the subject matter the Judiciary Committee deals with um, is of a different nature than some of the other committees. We're each different, we're set up with different jurisdictions, but I've certainly always looked upon Judiciary as a committee that has a very heavy portfolio. Um, in that you're talking about people's rights, that you're talking about their ability to access justice, and because of the focus of you and others, you're talking about the reforms necessary uh, to ensure we do better going forward. And that's a, a very unique position, and I want to thank you for your contributions, both as a, an attorney, someone who has legal expertise and experience on the committee, but also for your leadership, because I've seen you carry, um, without question, some of the most comprehensive bill presentations on the floor. Uh, you have an eye for detail. Um, and I know there's so much we could talk about because of your experience in education and other areas, but we don't have time today. But really, you're an, a, just a phenomenal member of the House. And I'm really grateful for the work we've done together and looking forward to working with you in the future. I just have so much respect for the work you have done. Well, thank you very much. And, and I'm just wordy is what it is, actually. You know, people actually want me to shut up when I'm on the floor frequently. But but yeah, back at you. I mean, we're going to definitely miss you in, in the House. You've been a great legislator. And, and the work that you've done on the Education Committee uh, is important work to keep folks out of the criminal justice system. I mean, that, you know, getting, getting it right, right up front and with the work that you did on Act One uh, with respect to, you, know, you probably can describe that better than I, I can, but uh, uh, with respect to really changing our curriculum around uh, some of the racial issues uh, has been very important. So we'll definitely miss you, although we'll see you, uh, hopefully, if I have anything to do with it, uh, downstairs in the Senate, uh, continuing your excellent work. So I, I definitely am happy that uh, to be endorsing you and, and also really think that you would be an excellent senator. Uh, and, and because I'm saying these nice things to you, I want you to make sure that you work closely with me when you get into the Senate. Right. Yeah, well, <laughs> all right, you know where to find me and I know where to find you. But, you know, again, we, we have a lot of work to do. And yeah. whether it be uh, the immediate issues that we'll be working on this summer or longer term, really changing uh, how our institution functions to ensure all voices are heard, um, it's a constant effort. And so again, I'm just really glad you're running again and looking forward to working with you. And Martin, if there's ever any time we can get together and trade books there, you, it looks like you got a library. We got a bit of a library too. We're kind of bookworms. So, you know, let me know if you ever spill coffee on one of your books up there. I'll, I'll loan you a, a spare copy. How about that? Excellent. Excellent. Lots of good, lots of good readings been getting done the last few weeks. Good, good. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Martin Lalone, uh, state representative from South Burlington, member of the Judiciary Committee, um, and someone who, again, I just have so much respect for. Martin, thank you for joining me, and let's continue this conversation, and hopefully uh, we're standing together next year doing some of this. Yeah, work. I hope so. I hope so.